Okay, so hello everyone. My name is David Brasdell. Uh, I work on the Android Virtualization Framework team. Uh, we also have Sherban on the video conference. So if there's any questions for our PM, answer it uh, remotely. This um, slot is about how we use virtualization on Android devices. So this is different from projects like Castlefish that run Android in a virtualized environment. Um, we borrow ideas from confidential computing and we try to apply them uh, to strengthen the application sandbox uh, in Android. And we think that this is gonna be uh, an important piece of technology for kind of the next generation of, uh, of Android use cases. So this is just gonna be a very brief high level overview of what we've done and, and what are our plans. Um, give you some context, Android has all sorts of mechanisms for uh, defending itself against malicious uh, code. It starts in the application market with some malware scanning, continues on the device with the application sandbox, which is enforced with a variety of kernel features, starting with the process isolation, SC policy, C groups, et cetera, et cetera. And all this works really well, but it's a, it's a fairly large attack surface. So occasionally there's a vulnerability that leaves the devices and user data uh, exposed until that problem is fixed. Um, so because of that, the most crucial services in the system, uh, stuff like Keymint handling your crypto or Gatekeeper handling your authentication, uh, those run outside of the main operating system, outside of the Linux kernel in an isolated execution environment. Is provided by the vendors. It's typically like a more privileged execution layer in the in the SOC, um, and because it's provided by vendors, it's it's fragmented. There's very little standardization, um, both in terms of APIs and the feature sets. So those environments can vary quite uh, rapidly in terms of the you know, the richness of of that execution environment, uh, how easily you can apply security updates. Um, and there's typically no mutual distrust. So this is part of the TCB of, of the main operating system. If there's a vulnerability in there, it affects the rest of the system. Um, it works fine for the current use cases, this, these kind of root of trust uh, services, but because of that fragmentation, it's not something that we could expose to application developers as a, as a development target. Um, and it's a shame because when we look at the kind of the next crop of, of use cases, they're you know, becoming more personalized, more context aware, they might be handling medical data, uh, your digital assets, like your digital car keys these days, um, and they could really benefit from, from the assurances you get from these isolated environments. Um, so we wanna work towards building a standard implementation of that, so we can scale across the ecosystem offer that to application developers. And it also means that if we, if we deploy more use cases into that environment, it's not gonna increase the size of that TCB. Um, so we're working towards what we call protected computing, and that environment needs to be isolated from as many components in the system as possible to reduce its attack surface. It needs to be updatable using the same containers and the same infrastructure that we use to update the rest of the, the system, and needs to follow the principle of least privilege. You know, we can't, we can't keep moving more and more uh, code into, into the TCB. It needs to be a deprivileged environment. Um, so this is where the Android virtualization framework uh, comes in. This is where we borrow ideas from uh, confidential computing. Uh, at, the, at the center is a hypervisor. Um, and our reference implementation is what we call PKVM, which is the ARM64 uh, KVM with an, a new protected mode that allows you to spin up virtual machines that the host, the main operating system, uh, cannot access. And so the host remains in charge of most of the resources. It's still in charge of scheduling most devices, uh, but the hypervisor guarantees that it cannot read or anyway access the memory of, uh, of that virtual machine, and that includes DMA. Uh, so that hypervisor controls IOMMUs. Currently the only one supported is uh, called S2MPU. We're also working on uh, supporting the ARM 
I think I'm going to be free. It's coming uh, soon. Um, and the, the guest, this protected virtual machine, has access to new uh, hypercalls. So it can uh, tell the hypervisor, take some of my private memory and make it available to the host, just a subset of it. And that's used for uh, virtio communication with bounce buffering. Uh, another example is TRNG, so the, the guest needs to uh, needs to initialize its entropy pool somehow. So there's a there's a hypercall to give it a bit of entropy. Um, all of that already exists in the Android 13 uh, common kernels, the, both the 5.10 and the 5.15. We're very actively working on upstreaming all of these features. If you're interested in PKVM, we're giving a bunch of talks at uh, KVM Forum. Um, there's going to be a technical deep dive tomorrow morning. That might be a, a good good talk to uh, to attend. Um, but as I said, this is this is a reference implementation. So we actually allow uh, vendors to bring their own hypervisor, uh, and it is completely abstracted away in the in the architecture. Right? So the, the hypervisor needs to meet certain requirements, needs to expose the standard environment to the guests, um, but it is abstracted away in uh, for the Android app developers. So there's a Java API uh, currently that's not public. It's not available through third-party apps, but something we're working towards. So right now it's just platform code that can make use of this, um, but it can call through virtualization service, kind of like our libvirt, uh, into CrossVM, which is our uh, Rust-based virtual machine monitor that we share with uh, Chrome OS, and uh, use that to spin up either a protected or non-protected virtual machine. Um, and we provide a kind of like a base distro to run inside those VMs, which is called MicroDroid. It's just a lightweight, um, heavily stripped down uh, version of Android, it's just a Linux kernel with a very minimal uh, user space on top that allows you to run uh, native uh, payloads. There's no Java in there because it would be too resource intensive. Um, we've also extended libbinder. Um, to work over sockets. So that virtual machine can connect back to the main OS over VSOC. They can establish a binder connection uh, on top of it. As a result, that makes up for a very straightforward and familiar programming model to app developers. Um, they All they need to do is create a native NDK shared library, put that in their uh, APK, and then using the API, they start a new VM, the APK gets mounted inside MicroDroid based on a based on some configuration. The right native library is, is called. The library can start a binder service on BSOC and expose that back to the Android application that's running in the main OS. Right? And they can then uh, talk to each other over binders, send commands, get results. Uh, so all of that kind of looks like talking to another process, another service in, uh, in Android, but it's actually happening uh, between two virtual machines that are mutually distrusting and fully isolated from each other. Um, the VMs also have access to a unique secret. Um, there was a talk on DICE this morning, so I'm not going to go into, uh, into details, but basically there's a unique device secret in every Android device, and we combine that with measurements of everything that was loaded into the VM. And through a key derivation function, we arrive at a, at a unique secret for that particular VM instance. And it can use it to either encrypt its state between reboots, uh, or it can derive a signing key, for example, which is what we're using in our first use case uh, that compiles and signs uh, system jars in, in this environment. Um, all of this shipped in uh, Android T, a few months ago, there's public documentation on sourceandroid.com, um, and we have uh, an email address if you if you want to uh, talk to us uh, about about using some of this. Um, and I promise this would be a, a very very quick overview because I want to leave leave some time. Any basic. This right outward the using 
Yes. So there's. Like I'm not familiar with that because in my mind, the host connects. For some reason, in this case, it can't. This is more s similar to a type one hypervisor like Xen, where uh, the host is like a privileged guest. Um, we call it type 1.5. Um, so it f the APIs for the traditional type 2 KVM model, uh, but the guest is actually restricted from accessing the guest memory using the stage two MMU and IMME. So that memory is unmapped in that stage two page table um, and it will fault if you, if you try to access it from the host. mentioned the the root of trust use cases that are using kind of the vendor TEEs. are you thinking of migrating those to this model as well yeah it's going to be a slow process but that's that's what we would like to get to kind of right now if you look at um what um get as a vendor it's like a core package of, of like all the android source code and then a spec of all the services that you have to implement so over time you would like to reduce the size of that spec and just say you know, make sure that the hypervisor works and you get all these uh, critical services for free. It'll be a long process, but it's it's something that we, we want to get to eventually. Uh, can you give some concrete use cases for um, virtualization in this way? What, what kind of thing would you expect people to be running in these VMs? Um, so a good example is uh, machine learning models. Those uh, today. Um, the uh, use case that we already shipped is called isolated compilation. It's a, that's a platform use case uh, where uh, where uh, actually, you know what? We have our PM on the on the call. Can we can we give this question? Shervan, are you there? Can you hear me? So the question was use cases for AVF. Yes. Can Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Okay. So I think as David mentioned, uh, there are a number of use cases that we're working towards. Uh, they all kind of build on top of uh, confidentiality and integrity. Uh, for example, uh, we're looking at protecting uh, machine learning use cases, either by protecting the IP, uh, so the machine learning model, or protecting the data that's used to train those models. And that data could be uh, something that's confidential or something that's personal to the user. Uh, you could think of devices becoming more intelligent and maybe using more sensors than they, they do today. Uh, and you can think about expanding use cases like OKG and other uh, use cases like that. Um, but also over time, we plan on integrating this more closely with the platform. Uh, today, we deploy a use case called um, isolated compilation, where basically on OTA updates, uh, we compile the Android framework uh, in um, one of these isolated execution environments. Uh, and we, by doing that, we give back uh, users uh, a bunch of seconds or a bunch of minutes, depending on the device, uh, that they would have otherwise wait, waited on uh, the first boot after an OTA update. Um, so we think there are many use cases where we can deploy this technology. Uh, the many use cases where we use Trazon today, uh, and we think that it's reaching the end of the road. Um, so um, overall, we're excited uh, and hope that you folks are going to find out more about those use cases uh, in in the coming um, months and years. Uh, we're working internally with Google, with Google Teams, but also with partners uh, on deploying the next generation use cases for a year. Uh, I have a question. So I'm not sure exactly how the hardware isolation works. So that's why my question. Mm -hmm. So if you have a separate chip that is doing the trusted execution, it's 
a bit more isolated, right? So in this case, the virtual machine still runs on the same processor as the unprivileged stuff. So my question in the end is, do you still st uh, share the cache with like, un uh, like unprivileged users? Right. Um, so something like side channel attacks, that's out of like that's outside of the thread model. Okay. Uh, so we share the same CPU. It's it's already done with um, MMU isolation. Um, we know that there are implementations out there for the for Trust Zone that uh, are an are a separate chip that try to get around what you just described. But that's not what we're trying to do. Okay. Thanks. And time's up.